What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Don't Give Up the Ship Podcast. This is episode 67. It's a little late. <laughs> it's officer programs. Uh, this was a request from a listener. I have, have had the outline done for a hot minute, and uh, other stuff came up. It was just a, a problem with me having time to uh, edit and then got other stuff came up with interviews and stuff like that. So it just became easier to record those and edit those. And, uh, just me finding the time to go through the outline, make sure everything was good just cause I like to do one last QA and then actually record it proved a little more difficult, but here we are. Uh, finally episode 67 officer programs. And this one is different from, so you can go back it's episode 47, uh, is myself and Jeff Bayless. It's called, so you want to be an officer. Uh, we talk mainly about like the idea of and what the why behind becoming an officer, like kind of like why a sailor would want to do it, what you're getting yourself into, what the difference between that is and staying enlisted and kind of going the, the chief path, stuff like that. Um, we go, it was, it was kind of general. We didn't really d- dive deep into the policy stuff. This episode is the policy stuff. This was something that when episode 47 came out, a listener asked, uh, like, Hey, can we do a deep dive into the actual officer programs instruction? And so that's what this is. Um, I understand that I, I spent a bunch of time doing research in the instruction. I am pretty familiar with it cause I've helped some people go through the LDO program. Um, but not a high level expert on every single one of these. And you'll hear me talk a lot about getting a mentor. All right. So like went through the instruction, did the research, and I'm going to share all that information with you, but understand that there are going to be little intricacies for each program that you're going to need a mentor for, uh, and that you're going to need to explore all these references that I linked to in the show notes and everything else. But, uh, let's go ahead and get into it. So uh, this was something that I wanted to spend a good amount of time on because it's something that a lot of junior sailors are very interested in. So the concept behind it was if you want to be an officer, whether it's a staff or a line officer, and the difference between those are specialties and line officers are like, I'm going to command a ship, uh, you should do it. And don't let anybody stand in your way when you say, I want to be an officer, which many, many junior sailors do. And I speak from career counselor experience. Uh, everybody either wanted to be a Ninja Rambo seal, which like they and they found themselves in the complete polar opposite of that. Uh, that place when we're doing their reporting CDB or they wanted to be an officer. Either one is, is fine to pursue if you're serious about it. And that that's kind of an, an, it seems like an extreme example where everybody's like, I want to be a Navy SEAL. And it's like, well, you're a nuclear electrician. So how did you end up here? If you really wanted it, you'd be pursuing it. The officer program stuff's a little different because you can you can, and I mean, you can kind of ascend to this, to special warfare from almost any community. Um, but, but as far as officers go, you can, you can ascend from any community in the Navy. Uh, everybody's got a program that you can use or multiple programs, like multiple different paths. And we'll talk about all of them, uh, that you can do, you can use to ascend uh, to the officer ranks. And so I highly recommend doing it. All right. If it, and the thing is, and we're this is something I'm going to beat up on a lot too, is junior sailors can and should be their best advocates when pursuing a commission. This starts with getting in the instruction and leveraging all available resources, including seeking a mentor, which I previously mentioned, in the community for which you'll be applying to get selected. Okay, so you you have to be the squeaky wheel, and I have and always will be an advocate for squeaky wheels. Right? I like fixing things. If a wheel squeaks, I want to grease it so it runs smooth. Right? But sailors that want things. That's the squeaky wheel. That's what the metaphor is, right? I love helping sailors that want things, but you have to show me you want it. Don't just say it and complain when the universe doesn't hand it to you with a bow on it. Show me, compete, better yourself, get in the books and come to me educated. There's in the age of the Google machine, like you can't not find anything. So it's like, if you, if you can't tell me, Anything about your designator that you want to apply for or the program for which you want to apply in the age of of Google, you're not showing me much. I will bend over backwards to direct you to the resources and help you navigate the application process. And so will a lot of other leadership. But you need to show me and those leaders and the Navy that you really want it. You're not just saying it at a CDB and then expecting us to just do it for you. Okay, it's it's definitely the process in and of itself is built to weed those people out, which is why that you don't see a ton of people uh, getting selected for commissioning programs. Uh, you just see the people who put in the work, right? Uh, before I get too deep into it, 
as always, if you need anything from us, hit us up. Don't give up the ship podcast at gmail.com. You can Facebook message us. Don't give up the ship podcast. You can DM me on Instagram or Reddit, DGUS podcast. Hit us up. Okay. If you have questions about anything we talk about in this episode, if you're having trouble getting a mentor, if you don't know where to look, if I if I don't do a good enough job explaining where to find certain resources, or you forgot that I said they're all in the show notes, just reach out, ask the question, and I will help direct you to the resources. I will give you the advice that you need. Um, but nobody can do it for you. Okay, and and the the thing that you need to do first, as always, is get in the reference. Okay, I, I mentioned it quickly, but most sailors are weeded out during the application process. So if you come to me, you want to apply for officer programs, I'll refer you to the instruction. Like the reference is where I always go first. And I, after asking if you looked at it, which most people respond, where can I find it? And then you're overwhelmed by its content. So I'm gonna I'm gonna direct you to where it is. It's a lot of information. After which. You then have to tackle an intimidating application process, and that's on purpose. And, and, and don't get me wrong, if you, review the, if you review the entire chapter they devoted to filling out the application and highlighted your own section, which is specific to the program for which you want to apply, it's a different chapter, right? They have a chapter all on the application process, and then they have a chapter all on the program for which you want to apply. And you follow the associated checklist specific to your program. So they have a checklist in the appendixes, in the appendices, appendices, I think that's how you say it in English. Uh, the checklist will tell you how to fill out the pro the program specific stuff on your application because everybody uses the same application, but it's filled out slightly different differently and has some have like additional requirements or whatever. So you have the officer programs application. You have the ch- an entire chapter that tells you how to fill that out generally. And then you have your entire chapter on your program for which you want to apply and a checklist. OK, so it's straightforward. It's just long and involved. All right, but we'll get to that later. Step one, as always, get into the instruction. Uh, The link's in the show notes and in the outline, and it's on the Google machine, but you need to go to the OpNav Instruction 1420.1 series, currently Bravo, via Navy Personnel Command. And I always say this, and I think a lot of people just err on the side of laziness and go to Google and type in OpNav Instruction 1420.1. Here's the problem with that. You need to go to NPC instead of Google because a randomly returned search engine link may give you an old revision, may give you something completely different. You don't really know what you're getting. You need to go to the source. So like when they update an instruction, they're going to upload it on NPC. So you, it, it takes a second. You go on NPC, you go to references, you go to instructions, you go. You have to go to because there's Buper's instructions and Hopnav instructions and all these other instructions, right? So you have to go find it. It's going to take a second. You're going to click through like six links to get there. but you need to do that to make sure you get the, the most current revision of the instruction because just just recently I was talking about how the um, I think it was the FAP instruction, the Family Advocacy Program, hadn't been updated since 2008, and I was just like, I can't believe this has. And then I was talking to my supply officer about how ridiculous that was, and then I went on to NPC and found that they had just recently updated the instruction, and in, I think in May. So you got to go and make sure. Get, and it's because I had an old one on my share drive, um, and that's what I had opened. And then I was like, let me go double check, you know, because I I always preach this, and sh- and sure enough, I was wrong. Uh, and there was a brand new revision. So make sure you go to NPC, you follow that references link. And and again, the, the whole link is in the show notes. So you don't need, I don't even need you to go try to figure out how to navigate from references to instructions to whatever you should. You should go play around in there because it'll help you find things in the future. There's a lot of really uh, useful references through that like window of, of NPC references. But for the sake of officer programs, the link is in the description. Like, go into the show notes and you can just click on a link and it'll take you directly to the instruction. Okay, so make sure you go to MPC. That's the big thing. Uh, also, take the time to review and understand all the sections of the chapter, which contains detailed eligibility requirements, which I'm going to go over next. The specific requirements for the application process related to your program as well as guidance for your commander for both a recommendation and proper processing and submission of your package. That's a really important sentence, okay? Because when you say, when you read an instruction, especially for something like officer programs, and it says your commander needs to do this, they need to recommend you, they need to rank you, they need to do all these other things, right? A lot of the officers that are gonna be in the position of being your commander, your commanding officer, They went to college of some kind, whether it was a Naval Academy or just a normal university and went through an ROTC program or the Naval Academy to commission most, not all, most. 
So they're not necessarily going to be an expert on officer accession programs because they've always been an officer. They they ascended through a recruiter. They got recruited. They came in with a degree or they came in and went through ROTC or the Naval Academy to get a degree. And then they were commissioned. That's it. They're not officer programs instruction experts. So if you need something from your commander, you need to set them up for success. So you need to read and understand and talk to a mentor about what you need from your commander so that your package can get done the way it needs to get done, okay? And th this'll become evident as we go through a lot of the stuff, but you need to be ready and willing and able to give your commander everything they need to help you succeed, okay? Because they're, they're not gonna be an officer programs instruction expert just because they're an officer. So, moving on to the actual programs. This is where we get into the nitty gritty of the instruction. And I'm just gonna put a disclaimer out right now. This is gonna get kinda dry. If you're not specifically here to learn about the nuts and bolts of OpNav Instruction 1420.1 Bravo because you wanna be an officer when you grow up, or 1420.1 series, then this is probably not the podcast for you. I'm not gonna lie to you. This is, it is a very good leadership tool because, and, and, I, and I'll talk about that later as well, but um, being familiar with and aware of these programs uh, will help you help your sailors ascend through these programs. So it's, it's obviously a good thing, but I'm just saying this is not gonna be as, uh, as intellectually stimulating, hopefully, as some of my other podcasts are. It's just gonna be policy and the explanation of. That being said, programs, all right? There's several paths to a commission, uh, many that sailors are completely unaware of, some of which I was vaguely aware of, but pretty unfamiliar with. And I'll provide short descriptions of each, but, but the programs covered in the instruction are the U.S. Naval Academy and the Naval Academy, Academy Preparatory School. And those are kind of the same, they're the same chapter, they're kind of the same thing. I'll explain what those mean uh, here in a second. Officer Candidate School, or OCS, which I think most junior enlisted have probably heard of. Like, if you get your degree, your bachelor's degree, you can go to OCS and be an officer. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Medical Enlisted Commissioning Program. Uh, this is commonly referred to as MECPS, or M-E-C-P. I'm not sure how the medical people talk about it, but I've heard it referred to several times as MECPS. Um, medical Service Corps In-Service Procurement Program, or MSCIPP. Um, I don't have a fun pronunciation for that one. That's just, it's just started as MSCIPP. That's one of the ones that I was like, I, I kind of knew there was another medical one, but I didn't really know what it was. And there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. Uh, limited duty officer and chief warrant officer program, LDO, CWO. Uh, most people I think are, are pseudo familiar with that. Uh, and then Seaman Admiral, probably the most popular or State 21. Uh, and we'll we'll get into that as well. OK, so we're going to start with the first program chapter. Chapter three is the U.S. Naval Academy and uh, Naval Academy Preparatory School or NAPS. OK, so first, the U.S. Naval Academy is a four year military college that offers an outstanding opportunity for qualified young persons to embark on careers as officers in the Navy or Marine Corps after obtaining a BS degree. Okay, so that's that's an important statement first that I wanna to touch on because this was something I didn't know before I had some conversations with some Naval Academy grads around one of my submarines. So any junior enlisted sailor, right? So Naval enlisted person can apply to and be accepted to the Naval Academy, right? Once you're there and you're pursuing your education, there is a, there is a fork in the road at some point where you get to decide whether you want to be a Naval officer or a Marine Corps officer. So even if you were a sailor first, you can go Marine Corps and, and vice versa. So there are enlisted Marines that go to the Naval Academy and become Naval officers. So that's a, a decision point. And it's also kind of like a feature of the program, right? Like if you want to, if you're in the Navy and you kind of, maybe you did three years and you're crushing it and you become an officer, but you're like, nah, I kind of want to be a Marine Corps officer. I, maybe you want to be a Marine infantry officer. Maybe you want to be, you want to do something in the Marine Corps that you can't do in the Navy, or you just like the Marine Corps better. Maybe you were on an amphib and you were expo exposed to the Corps and you're just like, yeah, that's more me. Uh, that's a, a thing that you can do. You can become a Marine Corps officer. And, and there's a decision point somewhere in there. I want to say it's the third year, but don't quote me on that. And it didn't say in the instruction. Uh, but that's a thing that you just find a Naval Academy grad. They'll be able to explain the whole process to you. Uh, but that's like a feature of the program. If you wanted to, you could go from the Navy to the Marine Corps while you're at the U.S. Naval Academy. So students at USNA are midshipmen serving in the U.S. Navy and receive pay plus tuition, room, and board. Candidates report to the U.S. Naval Academy usually in late June or early July for plebe summer. Uh, it's kind of like a like an indoctrination thing to the the Naval Academy and and how things work. Um, 
I don't know a lot about it, but it sounds kind of like um, almost like in a in a small way, like you could it, it's it aligns with the concept of chief's initiation in a, in a way. It's kind of just an indoctrination to the Naval Academy from what I understand. It looks and sounds like a lot of fun. If you Google it, you can see some pictures, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I've, I've only again never done it, never even been there, but I've had some stories conveyed to me from Naval Academy grads because I was always kind of curious about the Naval Academy and it was something I it was an idea I flirted with uh, while I was junior. And then, you know, here I am a fully indoctrinated Kool-Aid drinking senior chief. So uh, there you go. Graduates are commissioned as ensigns uh, in the U.S. Navy or as second lieutenants, as I mentioned earlier, in the U.S. Marine Corps. The minimum service obligation after graduation is five years active duty and three years in the individual ready reserve upon initial appointment. And for those that don't know what IR, IRR or individual ready reserve is, everybody's on IRR when they get out of the Navy for, I think, four years or something like that. It's just like if World War Three happens, like the active and and drilling reservists and all the other reserves are going to get called up first. And then IRR, it's like if you're on the hook at that point, it's not the draft. It's like you're technically a reservist, even though you're not drilling and you're not actively doing anything and they can call you back in. So naps, which is something I had no idea existed until I went to the senior enlisted academy, which is in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, on that naval base where the Naval War College is. That's also where naps is. Uh, we actually do some of our coursework for the Senior Enlisted Academy in the NAPS building. And what NAPS is, it's a Naval Academy preparatory school, okay? And it provides intensive instruction and preparation for the academic, military, and physical training at the U.S. Naval Academy. NAPS students are on active duty enlisted status in the U.S. Navy. The school convenes in July of each year and runs through May of the following year. Upon successful completion of NAPS, uh, appointments to the U.S. Naval Academy are offered. And those who accept the appointment report in late June or early July with the incoming class. Apps is basically uh, it, it for people that aren't quite ready academically for the Naval Academy and the demands of the Naval Academy. Uh, and I my understanding is that that's determined bit during the application process. Like they kind of decide like, OK, these people are ready for the Naval Academy. These people need uh, some some more academic preparation for the Naval Academy, but clearly will succeed kind of thing. Um, it's it's the, again, my understanding upon asking questions uh, and I'll read a little blurb from their website as well, uh, just to try to help capture what naps actually is so it says it's it's located in newport Rhode island as i mentioned it's the fourth oldest school in the entire navy uh, only the naval academy naval or college naval post graduate school are older uh, the mission of the naval academy preparatory school is to enhance midshipmen candidates morale mental and physical foundations to prepare them for success at the u.s naval academy the 10-month course of instruction at naps lasting from august through may emphasizes preparation in english composition mathematics chemistry physics and information technology demanding military physical and character development programs complement the academic preparation to fully prepare students for the challenges of life at a service academy as part of the physical development programs naps officers offers a varsity athletic program that competes against other preparatory schools junior colleges and college junior varsity teams so it prepares you for the Naval Academy. Uh, any enlisted service member in the Navy or Marine Corps um, on active duty may apply for the U.S. Naval Academy or NAPS. Uh, in addition, enlisted members who apply to the U.S. Naval Academy are not and are not selected for direct entry. Entry are automatically considered for entrance into NAPS. So kind of like I mentioned when you put your officer programs instruction application in for the Naval Academy, if you're not selected for direct entry to the Naval Academy, uh, they'll automatically consider you for NAPS, which is a path to the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, to be considered for NAPS, applicants should not have passed their 22nd birthday on 1 July of the year that they will enter NAPS. So there's an age restriction there. So I'm going to go into some other eligibility stuff. Uh, this is just basic eligibility requirements. I did not cover every single thing in the chapter because, oh my God, this podcast would be forever long. So U.S. citizenship is required for entry to the U.S. Naval Academy. This cannot be waived. At least 17 years of age and must not have passed their 23rd birthday on 1 July of the year entering the U.S. Naval Academy. This is a statutory requirement and cannot be waived. Applicants must be of good moral character and have no court martials convictions or civilian felony convictions. No record of disciplinary action under the UCMJ Article 15 or conviction by civil court for misdemeanors except minor traffic violations 
during the three years preceding application for the program. Any substantiated drug use or alcohol abuse will result in disqualification. So that's important for sailors that have had an NJP during their first enlistment, maybe during their first year, but then three years has passed um, before the application. Like you have to allow that time to pass, but you can still apply for the program. All right. You might be on your first shore duty at like your six year point. If you're still below the age restriction of 23 on the year that you're going to be there, blah, blah, blah. You can still apply for the program. So just because you trip, you tripped up at some point does not mean you can't still apply for the Naval Academy. Make sure that you verify you are, in fact, eligible. But uh, during the three years preceding the application is the is the key word, tricky phrase there. So theoretically, for most people, if they come in the Navy at 18 years old, you have a, a grace period of about two years before you three more years can pass and you could still squeak in under that 23 year old limit there. But um, just under, and, and again, it says three years preceding application for the program. So when they receive the application three years prior. So just just be aware of that. And I encourage like enlisted leadership, like senior enlisted leadership to like push the boundaries there. Make them say no. If you have a sailor that like upon like uh, admission to the program would be the three year window would be there like just between the CEO's recommendation, letters of recommendation and any other thing on the application, like I'd still apply, make them tell you no. Right. If it's because it, it's or ask the questions of the program runner, like the people running the program. But I'm just saying, like, if you have a sailor that is clearly perfect for this program, uh, I would make him tell you no. And we'll get into some other stuff. Like, do you have to get a sponsor to get into the Naval Academy as well? And we'll get into that here in a second. Uh, unmarried, not pregnant, and have n- no incurred obligations of parenthood. This one's kind of a weird one. Um, but with how the, the only way that I can understand this, and I've asked the question and kind of gotten like, this is what I think, but not like an official answer on why this policy exists. So it's it's telling you, you can't be married, you can't be pregnant, and you have no incurred obligations of parenthood, meaning you're not like the primary caregiver for a child, or you're not going to have to like leave the service academy to go to some obligation of parenthood. And I think, and the way it's been explained to me, the reason for that is how involved being a student at a service academy is. And like I mentioned earlier with like the plebe summer thing, like this isn't a normal college. The U.S. Naval Academy is not a normal college. It is extremely involved. Like you live there, you sleep there, you wear uniforms every hour of every day is is you're a midshipman. There are are periods of time, as I understand it, that you can like during the holidays uh, and I think summer you do like a midshipman cruise and then you get there's some time off programmed in there during certain periods. But like you're not going out on the weekend and partying like you or whatever, like you don't have a ton of free time like a normal college. Like it's it's almost boot camp ish in a way. So it's like it's extremely involved and you do not have the bandwidth to do anything except be a midshipman. So it's it's different in that way. And because of that, I think they have this rule where it's like, you know, you can't you can't have any personal life commitments that can pull you away from the service academy. That's the way that I understand it. Uh, Again, find a Naval Academy mentor and I'm sure they could do a better job of explaining that to you. But that's the way that I understand it. Uh, applicants must be physically qualified and in excellent health and physical fitness as determined by a medical examination administered by the Department of the Defense Medical Examination Review Board. Uh, they will schedule this qualifying examination and will contact the applicant by mail. In most cases, a medical exam will be done uh, at the service member's local medical facility with the assistance of uh, the DOD MERB. Applicants must meet the following criteria. Have normal visual acuity, 2020 in each eye. Waivers may be granted. Have normal color perception. Uh, if applicants have any tattoos, brands, or pierced body parts, with the exception of a single earring perforation in each earlobe for women, these must not be visible when wearing regulation swim gear. Any tattoos or brands that are prejudicial to good or indiscipline, offensive, or are of a nature to bring discredit to the Naval Service are prohibited, regardless of location. So that one... I don't think exactly lines up with the Navy's tattoo policy for active duty sailors. Why do I bring that up? Because I think this is more restrictive. Uh, I don't know if they grant waivers. It doesn't say. And uh, it's something that I kind of 
if anybody can't find the answer, I owe you an answer, right? And, I'll, and I'm going to try to find this one. Um, it's something that it, I think that they are able to and probably do restrict it a little more than the Navy's normal tattoo policy. But then the question becomes, once you're commissioned as an officer, can you just start getting a mess of tattoos? So why would they even have this in the first place? Uh, the answers to those questions are, I don't know yet. Uh, I'm working on it and I haven't gotten an answer yet. So uh, if anybody runs into that problem uh, and needs help getting the answer, just shoot me an email and, and I will, uh, as soon as I get the response, I will give you that answer and help you help you resolve that if that's a, a problem for a, a sailor that wants to apply. All applicants must obtain a nomination from an official source. That's what I was talking about earlier about the sponsor thing. You have to get a nomination from an official source. Applicants should apply to all categories uh, of nominations for which they qualify. Detailed nomination procedures and sample formats for each nomination category are provided in reference G or on the U.S. Naval Academy's website. I have the link in the description and on the outline as well. Basically, uh, you need like a congressman or like a there's a bunch of other like there's a bunch of avenues uh, with which you can get a nomination uh, to attend the Naval Academy. But you have to get this nomination in order to attend. So but there's links on the website. Uh, members of Congress, vice president, Navy, and Marine Corps enlisted reserve officer training corps units, children of deceased or disabled vets, prisoners of war or missing in action and children of Medal of Honor recipients and then a presidential nomination. There's a bunch of paths. Go on the website, click the link and go down the path. But you you have to get a nomination as part of the application process. So make sure that's a thing that you do. Uh, scholastically qualified as determined by the U.S. Naval Academy based upon the following. Acceptable secondary school transcript with college preparatory subjects and grades indicating college capability and a class standing normally in the top 40 percent in high school to be competitive. Applicants should have completed four years of math, including strong foundation in geometry, algebra, and trigonometry, four years of English, and one year of chemistry. Additionally, physics, history, and two years of foreign language are strongly recommended. Courses in pre-calculus and calculus are also very valuable and encouraged. And then SAT, ACT scores, tests must be no more than two years old upon applying. Uh, to increase competitiveness, these tests should be taken within one year. To be considered for a SECNAV nomination, a candidate should obtain a SAT score of 550 math, 500 critical reading slash verbal or ACT scores of 24 math, 22 English. Uh, these scores are not competitive for entrance into the Naval Academy, but may place a candidate in contention for NAPS based on the whole person assessment. Tests may be taken more than once and the highest scores in each category uh, on either test will be accepted. So a couple of important things there. One, those are bare minimum scores that I listed. So 550 and 500 will make you eligible for NAPS. 24 and 22 uh, for math and English will make you eligible for NAPS. So obviously you want higher scores than that. And you can take the test as many times as you want. So there's a, a benefit there is like if you have to take it 10 times, take it 10 times and the highest score will be the one uh, applied to your application. And then you need to be recommended in writing by your commanding officer. That's a one line thing in the instruction, but there's a, it's a, it's probably one of the most important. It's something that they, the board, the selection board, right, to get into any officer session program is going to take very seriously, right? Your commanding officer's recommendation for you to be selected to the program. It's a very important part of your package and you should take a lot of time to craft that. And I, this is the only time I'm going to explain this in depth because every program requires a uh, CEO's recommendation, but it's going to start with you uh, and your direct supervisor. It's like in a way, right? Like writing an eval where you're going to craft this, you're going to write a lot of the content of this. Uh, and then your CEO will decide obviously how he or she wants to change that if at all. Right. But they're going to count on the chain of command to construct this with all the content that's required. Right. And there'll be, it's written up much like in the style of an eval, as far as like your accomplishments, the things you've done, how, you know, things you've done to demonstrate you're ready to be uh, a naval officer or that you'll be perfect for this program or whatever. So they're going to, encompass all of those things in that write up and they want a very, very strong recommendation from your CEO saying that this sailor is ready to go do this thing. So um, understand that going in and take the time to make sure that that happens the right way. And this is one of those. It's going to vary slightly, I'm sure, uh, from program to program. So take time to talk to your mentor 
uh, for the program, right? So, like, in this case, U.S. Naval Academy grad, go find one that, especially if fi- I would seek out one that came from the enlisted ranks, since that's generally who I'm speaking to here, is find a Naval Academy grad that was prior enlisted that applied for this program through the OPNAV instruction we're talking about and talk to them about that. Talk to them about those uh, those CO's recommendations, right? Anything you can do, especially if your CO's a Naval Academy grad, to uh, let them know and have conversations with your CO about the Naval Academy is even better. Um, just hint, hint, wink, wink, take my word for it. So uh, that's what I got for the Naval Academy. Again, take the time, explore the show notes, lots of resources, lots of websites, lots of other things outside of the instruction to explore, and then seek out a mentor, a prior enlisted, I ascended through the program in OpNav Instruction 1420.1 series to become a either NAPS or Naval Academy student, because if they were a NAPS student, they presumably became a Naval Academy grad. Find one of those mentors. One of the resources for doing that is the interwebs. <laughs> Reach out to a guy like me. I can put the call out on our platform. Go on a, a group like Basic Mentoring, or there's probably Naval Academy or Officer Programs Instructions, Facebook groups like Reddit is a great resource. Go on our Navy and just solicit, shoot a flare up. Say, hey, I'm looking for a prior enlisted Naval Academy graduate that ascended through that program in the Officer Programs Instruction. There's a bazillion ways to find them and they want to be found and they want to help you out. Uh, You can also just ask officers in your wardroom if there's an officer that you're comfortable with or just do a drive by with your department head and they're going to know. They're going to know who the Naval Academy grads in the wardroom are. They're going to know if any of them were prior enlisted, most likely. And they're going to they'll help you kind of make that connection. If there's any other Naval Academy grads on the ship, they might not be prior enlisted, but they might know a prior enlisted Naval Academy grad, even if they're out of the area that they can link you up with. So use that network. Ask those questions questions squeaky freaking wheel okay i can't say that enough the more questions you ask the more flares you shoot up as my buddy jeff bayless will say just like he did in uh episode 47 the universe will conspire to help you okay just shoot those flares up i will go way out of my way to help you find the person that you're looking for so will the rest of the world these people want to be found and they want to help you you just got to shoot up those flares okay break break OCS officer candidate school is up next. So OCS is an initial commissioning program for individuals possessing a minimum of a baccalaureate degree from an accredited institution. So this is the, you have a bachelor's degree and you're enlisted and you want to be an officer. Applicants for OCS may request designation depending on individual qualifications from available community designators within the unrestricted line, restricted line and staff or selected staff core designators. OCS is a program of intensive officer training and indoctrination of approximately 12 weeks located at Officer Training Course Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, same place as NAPS and the Senior Enlisted Academy, the same place I was, I was talking about before. Uh, the OCS course has been designed by Navy officers and educators to give an individual a basic knowledge of the high-tech naval establishment afloat and ashore and to prepare those individuals to assume the responsibilities of a naval officer and begin developing to their full potential. The OCS course is designed to prepare members to become commissioned officers by providing basic knowledge of the naval profession and is related military and academic and nautical subjects. It will provide moral, mental, and physical development and instill the highest ideals of duty, honor, and loyalty. In most cases, graduates will receive specialized follow-on training after OCS for their career field uh, to further prepare members for their initial fleet assignment. The training candidates receive during the course is divided into 13 units of instruction, naval history, naval orientation, seamanship, navigation, damage control, engineering, military law, administration, military training, physical fitness, and the Navy's third class swim course, naval leadership, and special emphasis programs. So there's a lot of training that goes into it, teaching how to be an officer, and then there's generally follow-on follow on training. Like for a supply officer, they would go to Supply Corps School, also in Newport, Rhode Island. Enlisted applicants selected for the program who are in pay grades E4 or below are designated officer candidates and advance to the pay grade of E5 upon reporting to OCS. Enlisted applicants in pay grade E5 and above are designated officer candidates in their present pay grade. So you're not going to get demoted, but if you're E4 or below, you will get pay grade-wise promoted to E5 while you're an officer candidate. And so that's what you get paid. 
Graduates of OCS are appointed as ensign U.S. Navy and incur a minimum activity obligation of four years. So that's active duty, four years. Certain designators incur a greater minimum activity duty obligation uh, because of their follow on training. So like nukes, uh, there's some other programs where it's like the training takes so long that they're going to get that four years of active duty out of you. I think a lot of the medical field, stuff like that, which may not apply to OCS, but it's so neither here nor there. There's certain designators that, based on the amount of training the Navy is going to have to give you so that you can do the job that you were selected for after the officer candidate school happens, you will have to incur more obligated time on active duty so you can complete the training and they can still get four years of you in the fleet. Uh, ODS, or Officer Development School, is an initial commissioning program for individuals possessing a minimum of a baccalaureate degree from an accredited institution. Applicants may request designation as a nuclear power instructor. Uh, ODS prepares officers of specific staff corps and restricted line communities as Navy leaders uh, supporting the fleet at Officer Training Command Newport Island. So same place, just different school for approximately five weeks. So medical chaplain, judge advocate, general corps, uh, program applicants must contact their nearest Navy officer recruiter to apply. This is a shorter program, uh, less boot camp like, more just they call it knife and fork school. So they're, they're teaching you just very specific officer cultural things before sending you to the fleet to do the job that you do. So like a chaplain has all their education done uh, and doesn't quite need the same things. A lot of times also, from my understanding, of a lot of these career fields, they can be uh, advanced ages, right? So like, uh, the guy I interviewed on the chaps episode was in his forties, I think when he went through. So like, I don't know. And I don't know exactly how they decide who goes to ODS and who goes to OCS, but understand that they're two different things. Uh, one of them OC, being OCS 12 week, more boot camp style, uh, of, of, of a school. And then ODS officer development school is five weeks of quote unquote, knife and fork school, but it's the school you go to before you get a commission when you have a baccalaureate degree. So some eligibility stuff, citizenship, uh, same thing. You have to be a U.S. citizen, cannot be waived. Age requirements, applicants must be at least 19 years old and meet the age requirements for the specific designators requested per the applicable uh, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations Manpower, blah, 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 blah program authorization. So all OCS applicants, regardless of designator, must be able to be commissioned prior to their 42nd birthday. So there could be a specific age requirement for your program. So make sure you meet that minimum age requirement. Uh, and then all OCS applicants, regardless of a designator, have to be commissioned prior to their 42nd birthday. Uh, below is a synopsis of age limitations based upon the date of commissioning. So there's a chart in the instruction that I'm not going to read through or, or belabor, but it, it's in the instruction. So you take a look at that. Uh, moral character and conduct. Applicants must be of good moral character and have no court martial conviction or civilian felony conviction, have no record of disciplinary action under the UCMJ, Article 15, or conviction by civilian court for misdemeanors except minor traffic violations during the three years preceding the application submission. So same thing as the U.S. Naval Academy. You have a three-year window. So you could have slipped up, but as long as you've gone three years prior to the application submission, you can apply. You are eligible. That doesn't mean that that conviction of whatever flavor uh, won't affect your com how competitive you are. Um, but three years preceding the application, you are eligible. Education. Applicants must possess a baccalaureate degree, as mentioned earlier, or higher from an accredited institution in a field of study or major, which satisfies the requirements for the specific designator desired. So you have to look at the designator you want to apply for. And within that chapter, there will be uh, degree requirements for some of them where you have to have a certain background to apply or not, right? There's some that you can have any baccalaureate degree, but just go through and look at that and make sure you meet the specifics. So for all unrestricted line designators, any technical or non-technical degree from an accredited institution will qualify. And again, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to deep dive into the requirements for other programs, but just understand that they exist. They're, they're detailed in the instruction. So you need to make sure that the program for which you want to apply, especially if you're pursuing a degree just to apply for the program, that you're actually pursuing a degree that makes you eligible for said program, right? So like if you want to do special warfare, they may have certain requirements within your degree or a certain major that you have to graduate with, right? So you just need to make sure you do that research. Chapter five, MESEPS, right? Uh, Medical Enlisted Commissioning Program. This one's cool. Uh, this one is, I always, I was always curious how they arrived on active duty. I kind of thought there was just like a, like 
recruiters just put nurses in the Navy, but it's not entirely true. So they have the MESEPS program. And it's a commissioning program specifically intended to provide an advancement pathway to commission status in the nurse corps, U.S. Navy, on the active duty list. So it's not intended to serve as a precursor to medical school, nor for academic programs leading to certification or licensure of uh, as a physical therapist, uh, physician's assistant or healthcare care specialty. MESEP pr- provides outstanding career motivated enlisted personnel of all ratings there's key you don't have to be a hospital corpsman to do this of all ratings who have attained previous college credit the opportunity to complete the requirements for an entry-level degree and ultimately a commission in the nurse corps so for those holding a valid nursing license having passed the national council licensure exam nclex and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, BSN, from a non-accredited institution. Applications for a Master in Science in Nursing will be considered as an entry-level degree. No entry grade credit would be granted, as the MSN would be the qualifying degree for the commissioning program in the Nurse Corps. So it sounds like if you have something from a non-accredited institution, you would get admitted to the program, finish your master's at, at an accredited school and then that would just be how you qualify so selectees for the program will participate in a nationally accredited academic program leading to a baccalaureate degree in nursing long distance learning programs are not acceptable when possible the college or university must be within 50 miles of a naval activity to which the participant will be ordered for administrative purposes on a pcs basis so that just means they need somewhere to transfer you uh, the Naval Academy, or <laughs> the Naval Academy, the Naval Activity may be a Navy Operational Support Center. It's like a reserve center, Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps Unit, or, or NROTC, or other Naval Command. MESEP students will receive full pay and allowances for their enlisted pay grade and are eligible for advancement while in college. That's a weird one. So normally you're not, but in this case you would be. Uh, so the student pays tuition fees, books, and other expenses incurred while participating in MESIPs. Navy-sponsored tuition assistance may not be used to pay for tuition, but selectees may seek financial assistance from other sources, including the Veterans Educational Assistance Program or the uh, Post-9-11 GI Bill, uh, if applicable, like if eligible, right? So it's kind of weird. A lot of other officer programs pay all the tuition and, and all the housing and lodging and all that stuff. This program's a little different, okay? Uh, you pay for everything. You can use your GI Bill if you're eligible uh, or other financial assistance for which you are eligible, but you can't use tuition assistance like you're a normal active duty sailor either. Kind of an odd program. Uh, selectees are required to complete the requirements for a baccalaureate degree or entry level master's degree in not more than 36 consecutive calendar months. That means you're going to school during the summer and everything and attend school on a full time year round basis. So that's basically what I just said, like 36 consecutive months, no breaks, no summer vacation, no nothing. Advanced academic standing may be granted at the discretion of the individual school. However, candidates must then complete the degree requirements in a proportionally reduced period of time. Meaning if you transfer a ton of credit, you don't have 36 months to just hang out and collect a paycheck. You They will effectively prorate like, OK, so based on what you have left, you only have 28 months or whatever. And they'll tell you what that is. Selectees disenrolled from MESEPs at any time. Uh, either for academic or administrative reasons will be made available and issued PCS orders to a new assignment in their enlisted rating to complete their active duty service obligation. Just means if you're dropped from the program for any reason at all, you will effectively revert back to whatever enlisted rating you were at whatever pay grade you were, and they will cut you PCS orders to finish your contract. Uh, So graduates from MESEPs are commissioned as an ensign, nurse corps, U.S. Navy. They attend ODS and incur an eight-year military service obligation with a minimum of four years served on active duty. So it's an eight year service obligation. Four of those will be active duty. And then you have the option to do reserves or whatever. Uh, Eligibility, uh, citizenship is required. Okay. This again, cannot be waived. Age requirement candidates must be able to complete the baccalaureate nursing degree requirements and be commissioned prior to their 42nd birthday. Uh, Applicants must be of good moral character and have no court martial convictions, et cetera. During the three years preceding one October of the fiscal year in which the selection is held. So same thing, the except the, instead of you being uh, 
admitted to the institution the admission date is effectively one October of the fiscal year in which the selection is going to happen for that year's applicants. Okay, so three years prior to selection, you need to have no NGPs, no big court things outside of traffic violations, just like every other program. Be, you need to be serving on active duty as enlisted personnel in any rating. And that's a key one for this one because it's a nurse corps. Any rating doesn't have to be medical uh, in the U.S. Navy or reserve, including FTS reserves on active duty for special work or one, two and three are recalls and canvasser recruiters. Not the same as NCs are not eligible for this program. Not sure why. I'm sure it's some administrative weird thing. But just to be clear, reserves on active duty for special work or one, two, and three are recalls and canvasser recruiters, not the same as NCs, are not eligible for this program. Uh, and then uh, it, performance record, have a superb performance record as well as strong academic potential. Every single program, that's a, a prerequisite. And that's an important thing to kind of note is that you need to be extremely good at your job and have a good performance record, regardless of what you're doing at the time when you apply for the programs, you need to have a strong performance record. Um, it, if you're not good at whatever you're doing right now, then it's it implies that you're not going to be very good at whatever you're applying for. And they're all competitive. Everybody that applies for these programs has at least an above average service record, right? Uh, or people that are selected anyway. So it's going to be very competitive. Like lots of people apply. It's going to be very competitive. You're going to be competing against the best and brightest. So just understand that going in that you need to be performing at a very high level in the job you're doing. Because 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 what I encounter a lot of the times is sailors are not happy in their enlisted rating and they're looking for a way out. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You're allowed to not be thrilled with your current lot in life. But you are not allowed to like sit there and have subpar performance and think you're going to get selected for an officer program because it's not going to happen. If you go in with with garbage evals and are are doing a poor job and not putting any effort into what you're doing now, the assumption is going to be made that you're a subpar performer that is not good for the program. OK, so just understand that going in. That's a thing that. I, I kind of see a lot as like, they're like, ah, I'm just looking for, it, I just need to find something I'm passionate about and I'll be good at that. Well, that's not how this is going to work competitively. Education is scholastic aptitude. So you have to be a high school graduate, uh, obviously, because you're going to need to get a, a college degree. Um, military educational experience and GED are acceptable if they are issued by the Department of Education. Uh, of a state, commonwealth, or territory of the United States or District of Columbia. You have to have a certified copy of your SAT and ACT scores no older than three years from the application date. Minimum recommended scores are 1,000 SAT, 500 math, 500 critical reading and verbal, or a 42 ACT, 21 math, 21 English. Have applied for acceptance or transfer into a baccalaureate or entry-level master's degree in nursing program during the fiscal year for which the selection board is held at the United States College or university and its nursing school that is accredited by the National League for Nursing Accrediting Commission, NLNAC, or the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, CCNE. Be able to uh, complete any prerequisites and the requirements for a baccalaureate or entry-level master's degree in nursing within 36 consecutive months from the date of enrollment into MESEPs. Full-time student status must be maintained throughout the calendar year, including fall, winter, spring, summer sessions. We covered that. Uh, therefore, acceptance must be to a college or university that offers those classes applicable to MESEPs for all the, of those sessions. So you have to apply to a school who offers the classes that you need to take to complete your degree year round. So that's an important thing to consider when you're looking for a school. Have a cumulative grade point average of 2.5 on a 4.0 scale. Have completed a minimum of 45 quarter or 30 semester credit hours in undergraduate courses such as English, mathematics, psychology, sociology, chemistry, biology, anatomy, physiology, nutrition, and have them accepted for transfer into the nursing program to which you are applying. Credit hours may be a combination of traditional classroom courses, college level entry program or CLEP credit online or distance learning and military training credits provided that non-traditional credits are accepted by the school you're applying to. So take advantage of that. Look at your joint service transcripts, talk to a Navy college counselor online and figure out what works best, right? Like that you're going to leverage all those credits to uh, get into the correct school and they will help you research what the correct school is and that they have the year round classes that you need and all of those things. Leverage the resources you have at your disposal, including Navy college. Individuals who already have a baccalaureate degree in nursing must have that degree accepted by NLNAC or CCNE School of Nursing for which they are applying to graduate school. 
physical qualifications, meet the requisite pre-commissioning accession physical standards for appointment as a nurse corps officer prescribed by a reference in chapter 15. Selectees who fail to meet these minimum physical standards for appointment may be appoint appointed upon the recommendation of the chief Bureau of Medicine and Surgery or BUMED uh, and waiver of the standards by deputy chief and naval personnel uh, acting for the chief and naval personnel can also get you through that process. Applicants are strongly recommended to submit a pre-commissioning SF-88 report of medical examination or SF-93 report of medical history or DD-2807-1-2808 within the last 12 months or 24 months for those applicants deployed. Applicants must meet physical fitness standards and BCA standards at the time of application. So they got to pass the PRT. Uh, while in training and at the time of commissioning, failure to maintain physical standards will result in immediate disenrollment. And then the CO's endorsement we talked about already. Every program you're going to have to be recommended by your commanding officer. So waivers of eligibility requirements are reviewed by BUPERS. Uh, it's BUPERS. TAC 3.1 is the code, like the office that does it. Waves, waivers of any eligibility requirements other than minor physical defects are not normally granted. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, it They're not going to grant a lot of waivers. Um, that's, I feel like, and Somebody out there, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's pretty common to the medical fields. Uh, speaking of which, uh, moving on to chapter six, MSC IPP. Uh, this one is the one I knew the least about. I kind of vaguely knew it existed, but there's a lot of really cool stuff in this program. So the MSC IPP provides a pathway to an officer commission for career motivated active duty enlisted personnel who meet the eligibility criteria. Some of these programs provide opportunities to complete either a baccalaureate, master's, or other professional degree. Programs include, and this is what's cool, I didn't know any of this, <laughs> any of this existed, healthcare administration, physician's assistant, radiation health officer, environmental health officer, industrial health officer, entomology officer, and pharmacist. That's cool. <laughs> That's a lot of really incredible stuff that I feel like a lot of people probably get out of the Navy and go to school for um, thinking that there probably isn't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if people ever seek these things out as possible programs where you can stay in the Navy to do it. Like, I didn't know this was a real thing. Uh, MSC IPP is available to the above communities for members of the regular Navy and Navy Reserve on active duty, including FTS and active reserve serving in any rating in pay grades E5 through E9. At the time of application, pay grade is not waiverable. So E5 to E9, period. Like you have to be an E5 to apply. Inactive duty ready reservists, reservists on uh, active duty for uh, special work, active duty for training, one to three year recall, uh, and Canrex are not eligible for this program. The MSC IPP website I have in the show notes and in the outline will announce the specific disciplines or fields of study being offered for that fiscal year and will provide other general guidance for applicants. There's also a NAV admin release that will tell you what programs they're uh, accepting applications for that year. Um, Candidates for the specialties identified in the annual NAV admin must possess a qualifying degree as described below. All non-master's degree prepared applicants, excluding pharmacy applicants, must submit official graduate record examination or graduate management admission tests or the appropriate test score defined within the specialty requirement completed within five years of the application due date. Minimum acceptable scores identified in the annual IPP NAV admin are required. All applicants who request to complete a bachelor's program must submit an official SAT or ACT score completed within five years of application due date. The minimum acceptable score for the SAT and or ACT will be noted in the annual IPP NAV admin because there's so many programs. Selectees will, with qualifying degrees will receive direct appointments to the MSC in a grade commensurate with the education level and degree concentration per reference B. An applicant desiring direct commission must earn a qualifying degree by 30 June following selection. A degree completion plan signed by a college or university official showing program of study, completion date, and number of credits and courses remaining is part of the required application. Degree completion plans must be realistic, and those having more than 15 hours remaining in their degree completion plan will not be eligible. Selectees who are going on to complete an appropriate degree will be commissioned upon completion of their graduate degree, an acceptance letter or ten, a tentative letter of acceptance to a full-time accredited graduate degree program with the degree completion plan is required. So you can get commissioned if you have the degree already or you can uh, apply for 
like the school for your particular program and go that way. Personnel selected for any of these programs who require training are provided between 24 to 48 months to complete their degree, dependent upon the program, because different degrees for different programs take different amounts of time. With benefits that include tuition, mandatory fees, book allowance, full pay, and allowances for their enlisted pay grades, and eligibility for advancement while in college. It is highly recommended that all requirements for the next advancement cycle be completed prior to detaching from the present command. The completion plan coursework uh, must not commence until the fall semester of the following of the year following selection. Following degree completion, selectees will be commissioned as officers in the MSC and attend officer development school. Selectees drop from IPP at any time, either for academic or administrative reasons, will be made available as PCS orders, blah, blah, blah. So you're going to revert back to your prior enlisted pay grade before you're selected to the program and go back to the fleet. Upon commissioning, selectees will incur a minimum of an eight-year military service application with a minimum of three years served on active duty. Selectees who obtain military-sponsored training will incur additional active duty obligations. So same thing, like if the school is going to defer when that three years active duty starts, and it's a program-to-program thing, so uh, you just need to do that research on what your program is going to require of you. Upon selection... Selectees will be required to coordinate closely with NAV, Med, Ed, Trey, Com. Selectees, excluding physician assistant selectees going to a full-time education program, should ideally get acceptance to an NROTC-affiliated university. Selectees will begin their education programs in the fall semester of the year following selection. Applicants are urged to contact NAV, Med, Ed, Trey, Com, Officer Graduate Programs, code OG3 at the following, and the numbers in the in the show, or in the uh outline, excuse me, and obviously the instruction and everything else. Eligibility. So U.S. citizenships required cannot be waived. Certified copy of birth naturalization certificate is required if applicable. In some states, it is illegal to copy, photocopy, or photograph birth certificates or naturalization certificates. Therefore, an applicant will use a DD-372. It's a form. Age requirement. Applicants must have not reached their 42nd birthday, much like the other ones. Moral character and conduct. Applicants must be of good moral character. Uh, having nothing except blah, blah, blah to the minor traffic violations during the three years preceding application for the program. For the purpose of this subparagraph, an offense involving DUI, DWI is a major traffic violation and is disqualifying if within three years preceding application for the program. Prior service drug use is not an immediate disqualifier. However, any substantiated drug use, a felony conviction, or any record of in-service drug abuse, regardless of the date, or alcohol abuse will result in disqualification. Uh, this is because it's the medical field may have access to drugs, etc. So, you know, they're pretty they're pretty uh, hard and fast on rules like this in the medical field, from my understanding. Obligated training applicants under obligated training require a waiver from their enlisted community manager. Uh, that just means if they're in some kind of training they're required to be at, they need to get a waiver to not to, to leave that and be selected. Physical qualification. Meet the requisite pre-commissioning session physical standards for appointment as an MSC officer prescribed in reference N chapter 15. Uh, you can find every time I say reference, whatever uh, chapter or whatever, the references are all. If you go to OpNav instruction 1420.1, go to the very, very top first page. It'll have all the references listed and it'll tell you exactly what it is. So you can go find that reference and read it if you need to, which for this program you do. Selectees who fail to meet these minimum physical standards for appointment may be appointed upon the recommendation of BUMED and waiver of standards uh, if you are granted a waiver. Performance record. Have a superb performance record as well as a strong academic potential and be favorably recommended for appointment by the candidate CO. So all those things we've talked about in the past and this, they went out of their way to put a, a, a sentence like that in there for obvious reasons. These programs are competitive. You need to have an, a superb performance record, quote, uh, a strong academic potential demonstrated by your past academic performance and be favorably recommended for appointment by your CO. So that the CO recommendation is a big deal. Security clearance. The SF-86 or EQIP is required for all applicants who do not possess a current NACLC or credit or and credit check. The command security manager should assist applicants in determining whether the appropriate agency check is on file in JPASS. So you just need to work with your security manager to submit an SF-86 uh, background check, which is generally done electronically through EQIP. Uh, if applicable to your program, um, it, it's just like a, it, it's an evolved process. Take some time. You might have to talk to an investigator, et cetera. 
Uh, so the, the further in advance you do this, the better. If you don't already have a, have a clearance, if you do check on the status of your renewal, if required, when is it coming? When's your reinvestigation coming up? Blah, blah, blah. See if there's anything you need to do to meet all the requirements of the program and make sure you work with your security manager to do that. Don't just assume you can do that on your own. All applications must be submitted by the deadline posted on the annual IPP NAV admin. As I mentioned previously, make sure you're in that NAV admin, uh, checking it out. Supplemental information is due by the supplemental deadline posted on the annual IPP NAV admin. Any correspondence not submitted by the supplemental deadline may be submitted to the president of the IPP board by the applicant prior to convening of the selection board. And then before I wrap up MSC IPP, because there are so many programs captured under this program, like under this chapter, right? There are specific program eligibility requirements for everything. Make sure you do the research in on the MSC IPP website within the chapter for all the programs specific to your program and, and the NAV admin, the get a mentor. Like there's there's tons of stuff that it's it's you use your checklist, everything that you have to take the time to become well versed in and work with a mentor to fully understand. OK, I, I am not an expert on every single officer program. Uh, I'm a general institutional expert on a lot of stuff, but like I can't I, there's it's impossible for me to be an expert on all these things. So number one, use all the resources at your disposal. Digest all the references, like highlight it, write notes in the margins, put little stickies on there, get on the website, digest all of that, get on the anything, the nav admin, highlight and and put notes on that, but then get a mentor to help you navigate and actually understand the words on the page so that you submit and meet all the requirements and do all the things. Okay. Take the time to do that. This, this program is, is probably the best illustration of the need to do that because there are so many programs to apply for an MSC IPP. And then each one of those sub programs to be a pharmacist, to be a medical administrator or a healthcare administration officer, to be all those things. Every one of them is different. Every one of the requirements are different. You got to find a school. You got to everything is different. <laughs> so it's like a bunch of sub programs beneath one program. Take the time to get a mentor. Use the checklist. Use all the references. Use all the things. But you got to take the time to to read, research, and then with the help of a mentor, fully understand all of the requirements of your specific program. Okay. Moving on to chapter seven. Limited duty officer and chief warrant officer. So this one is one for which I have applied myself a long time ago in a land far, far away. So it's been a minute, but the instruction was the same. Uh, it hasn't been updated in a long time. Uh, I'm sure there's been little tweaks, but via nav admin or whatever. But we're, we're on the same revision, I believe. So uh, the LDO and CWO programs provide commissioning opportunities to qualified senior enlisted personnel and chief warrant officers. Uh, and I'll explain why a chief warrant officer can apply for limited duty officer as we go through this. But... Uh, Chief Petty Officers, E7 through E9, and E6 personnel who are selection board eligible for E7. That was me when I applied. I wasn't a chief yet because uh, when I made chief, I decided I liked it too much. And then a chief warrant officer can apply for lieutenant junior grade. So once a chief petty officer gets selected for chief warrant officer, if they decide they want to go LDO for whatever reason, they can. And they'll be promoted to lieutenant JG instead of an uh, instead of as an ensign as they would have if they had applied directly for LDO may qualify for these programs. The LDO and CWO programs are open to both active duty and selective reserve personnel. Qualified personnel may apply for both LDO and CWO simultaneously. A baccalaureate degree is not required. However, it is encouraged. And I can tell you most applicants have a degree because it's just kind of one of those understood non-requirement requirements. But I'm sure there's people getting selected without it. I'm sure it happens. But it's pretty common that that most of these applicants have degrees. Uh, leadership ability, military qualifications, and technical expertise remain the key factors leading to selection. LDOs are technically oriented officers who perform duties limited to specific occupational fields and require strong managerial skills. Chief warrant officers are technical specialists who perform duties requiring extensive knowledge and skills of a specific occupational field at a level beyond what is normally expected of a master chief petty officer. So this is the difference and basically the job descriptions of limited duty officers and chief warrant officers. They're very technically focused. Uh, their scope of duty is very limited. So that's a thing to consider is like if you're a technician and if that's where you want to you want to stay in your technical field and be focused on that, that's that's what LDOs and CWOs do. 
So applicability for the program, uh, it applies to senior enlisted personnel in the following categories. Active duty enlisted personnel may seek appointment to commissioned officer status via the active duty LDO CW program. Full-time support personnel and Navy reservists on general recall who are selected under the active duty program will receive their appointments in the U.S. Navy. These personnel will be honorably discharged from their enlistment in the Naval Reserve and concurrently re-enlist in the regular Navy before being appointed as a temporary LDO. Eligibility, uh, service requirement, active duty applicants must be serving on active duty at the time application is made and if selected, they must remain on active duty until the appointment is tendered. Inactive duty applicants must be must have been serving in a drilling unit, pay or non-pay, of the ready reserve for at least one year at the time of application. Uh, and if selected, they must remain in a drill status until the appointment is tendered. Members who were serving under regular Navy or FTS enlistment and who enlist in the ready reserve with assignment to a drilling unit pay or non pay within 90 days following release from active duty do not need to complete the prescribed one year time period in a drilling unit. U.S. citizenship is required and cannot be waived, much, with, much like every other program. Must be a good moral character and have no record disciplinary action, blah, blah, blah. Uh, except minor traffic violations, 300 or less in the past three years. As of 1 October of the year the application is made, any substantiated drug or alcohol abuse within the last three years, as of 1 October of the year the application is made, will result in disqualification. Must be a high school graduate or possess an equivalency certificate. Must be physically qualified for appointment per the physical standards, outline or reference, and chapter 15, much like uh, the other programs as well. Must meet physical fitness standards of satisfactory medium or higher per reference A at the time of application and appointment. Must not exceed height or tenure requirements. Uh, service with the Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, and or Coast Guard may be credited to meet the minimum service requirement when it cannot when it can be clearly documented by the applicant that service in another branch provided the requisite training, knowledge, and expertise that directly relates to and parallels the needs and requirements of the Naval Service based for the designator which you're applying, right? So it has to be applicable to what you're trying to do as an LDO or a warrant. If applicable, comments regarding experience gained in another branch of service to include relation of the experience with the Navy's needs and requirements should be included in the applicant's personal statement of the OPNAV 1420-1, so of the application. The CO will attest to such qualifications in their endorsing statement. So for your favorable recommendation by the CO, which is the next uh, requirement, you need to address those uh, prior service experiences that apply towards uh, your application. Favorably recommended, as I mentioned, inactive duty applicants must be favorably recommended by their unit CO, must meet color perception requirements. Defective color perception is disqualifying for appointment in certain designators. So there are some designators that it doesn't matter. So make sure you're looking at your, uh, your specific designator requirements within chapter seven. Enlisted eligibility for limited duty officer. In addition to the eligibility requirements listed in paragraph five, which I already read of this chapter, LDO applicants must also meet the following requirements. Be serving as a petty officer first class or chief petty officer, E7 through E9. Uh, an E6 must have served in that capacity for at least one year as of one October of the year the application is made. So not one year as of the moment you're filling it out, one year as of like for the year that you're applying, right? So you could be, I mean, it's weird how that works because you could be applying way earlier in the year and uh, it's, you've only been a first class for, for five months or something. As long as you meet the one year requirement as of one October of the year the application is made, you're eligible. E6 applicants must complete all eligibility requirements for E7, except time and rate and leadership training continuum, whatever, which isn't even a thing anymore. Uh, so the all eligibility requirements, meaning you have to take the chief's exam and quote unquote make board. So you have to meet the minimum required standard to uh, make board as if you were competing for, for chief, but you're not. You're just taking it for LDO purposes. Personnel accepted for the LDO program. Uh, attend leadership training via ODS, so the Officer Development School in Newport, Rhode Island. E6 applicants must forward a copy of their most current examination profile sheet with their application, verifying that they, in fact, made board. An E6 is exempt from the requirements of the subparagraph when notification has been received by the CO that the individual is a selectee for CPO uh, and the advancement of CPO has been authorized. So, obviously, they don't need to make board if they're a chief select. Active duty time and service and inactive duty TQFS requirements. Active duty personnel must have completed at least eight, but not more than 16 years of active naval service day for day, exclusive of active duty uh, training 
in the Navy, Marine Corps, or Coast Guard Reserve as of 1 October, the year the application is made. So the time of service requirements is first class petty officer with one year in grade as of 1 October, the year the application is made, and eight years of service, not more than 16 years of service. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> if not, email me. Uh, enlisted eligibility for chief warrant officer, in addition to the eligibility requirements that we talked about earlier. CWO applicants must also meet the following requirements. Be a chief petty officer, E7 through E9, including E6 personnel when notification has been received by their CO that they are a chief select or that it has been authorized and serving on active duty as a member of the ready reserve in a drilling unit, pay or non-pay for an active duty applicants. So this is for chief warrant officer. If they're an E6 who has been notified that they've been selected to chief, you can apply for chief warrant officer. Active duty time service or inactive duty TQFS requirements. Active duty personnel must have completed at least 12, but not more than 22 years of active naval service day for day, exclusive of active duty training in the Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard Reserve as of 1 October, the year the application is made. So those are the requirements to apply for those programs. Understand chapter seven, lots of designators. It's a lot like uh, the MSC IPP in that there are within chief warrant officer and separately within limited duty officer, there's a ton of designators that are very specific to certain technical fields, right? So um, yeah, supply officer, food service, warrant officer, like there's like uh, every, almost every rating has one that they either are loosely affiliated or directly affiliated with as far as a special designator for your career field, right? So you need to, figure out what that designator is, learn about that designator and find out what the specific designator requirements are because they're different, right? Like we mentioned earlier, like a supply officer can be colorblind. A guy that works with electronics or a gal that works with electronics probably can be colorblind. So there's going to be a lot of different uh, requirements of the program that you need to make sure you meet all of them. So make sure you fully digest chapter seven. Uh, I'll have other links in the, in the show notes for like the there's a page on MPC. There's a bunch of other stuff. So, and like always find, and this is, this one's particularly important, just like MSC IPP, like find someone in the designator for which you're applying. So any limited duty officer or chief warrant officer will be helpful for the application process, but it's particularly important that you get uh, mentors within your designator for a couple of reasons. One, they're going to help you navigate all those requirements I just talked about that are specific to your designator. Two, you have to do what are called interview appraisals. And there's a couple of different types like for different programs that we've talked about where you have to do interview appraisals as part of the application process. But you, it's particularly with LDO, it's like you have to have, I think at least two, if I remember correctly, limited duty officers or chief warrant officers from your designator for which you're applying. So like if you're applying for LDO, at least two of them, I believe have to be from your designator and same thing for warrant. So you have to like, you have to learn who these people are. You have to find the most senior officers you can in that designator that will are willing to give you a, an interview appraisal. You have to, it's a very um, community, community oriented, like networking type of thing. Like you need to start to try to get to know the people in this community uh, because that's it's a very tiny community in that designator and everything that happens within that designator is governed by, you guessed it, officers in that designator. So find a mentor specific to your designator. OK, last but not least, chapter eight, state 21, seaman to admiral. I far and away likely the most uh, known officer program. And this program is open to enlisted personnel of all pay grades and ratings who meet eligibility requirements in paragraph I below, which I'll read. Since State 21 replaces several previously available commissioning paths a long time ago in a land far, far away, including the enlisted commissioning program, seaman admiral, and enlisted applications to NROTC scholarship programs, this chapter should be reviewed in its entirety. Shocking, right? Like Go through this thing with a fine-tooth comb, a highlighter, and a pen. Uh, individuals selected for and participating in the state 21 enlisted to officer commissioning program are not eligible to participate in immediate post commissioning graduate education programs, such as immediate graduate education program, voluntary graduate education program, etc. State 21 graduates must first complete their initial fleet service obligation operational assignment prior to gaining eligibility for Navy fully funded in resident graduate education programs. State 21 is a commissioning program 
that provides an excellent opportunity for highly motivated active duty enlisted personnel in the Navy or Naval Reserve, including FTS, CELRES, and Navy Reservists on active duty. Excluded are those on active duty training uh, to include uh, AT, I, TAC, A, C, D, U, T, R, A. I'm not really, this is all reservist stuff. I'm not going to even claim to be an expert on this at all, but if you're a reservist, I hope you know what this means. To complete requirements for a baccalaureate degree and earn a commission in the unrestricted line, uh, nurse corps, supply corps, medical corps, engineering corps, special duty officer, et cetera. I'm not going to read all those. Although the applicant's history of fleet performance will receive consideration during the selection process, Emphasis will also be placed on the identification of those applicants who possess both the academic and leadership potential necessary to become outstanding naval officers. So that is interesting that that's specifically called out because a lot of times people applying for state 21 are relatively junior. So how much like performance history do they really have and how much opportunity have they had to demonstrate that performance and get ranked really high? So the way I'm reading this is like they're going to they're going if it's available and if it's robust enough, they're going to consider like the the actual performance valuations and such. But emphasis will also be placed on identification of those applicants who possess both the academic and leadership potential necessary to become an outstanding naval officer. So the leadership potential piece, I feel like that's a piece of it, too. And here's why I'm reading this more than once. Right. Is I talked about and I, I believe it's been a long time since I did the episode, but the enlisted evaluation episode that we did writing evaluations for an e2 a lot of times get discounted as just like a check in the box type of process if a sailor that's an e3 that like say they showed up as an e1 and within two years they're like an e3 and they're applying for state 21 you taking the time to document their leadership potential necessary to become an outstanding naval officer is really important because guess what the selection board has? It has their own PF and a bunch of other documents submitted as part of the application process. But it's not like they get to sit down at, at all in all programs anyway, because some of them have interview appraisals. But the board doesn't get to sit down and interview the sailor. They don't get to serve with them for a year and evaluate them as a reporting senior. They don't know anything but what's told to them. So what's written in block 43 of those evals demonstrating not just their performance, but their leadership potential because their performance might not be robust enough to give them a ridiculous eval. So we undercut it and we're just like, ah, whatever, it's a need to, who cares? Well, th this is who cares. This is who cares, right? We're not, we say, and I stand behind that we're not writing the evaluation to make Sailor feel good about themselves. That's not, that's not what they're for, right? That's what awards are for. What we're doing is we're writing it to a selection board. And, and when we we as chiefs or leaders or whoever say that, what people think when you hear selection board is, is chief. They think an enlisted selection board. And that's not always what that means. A lot of the time, it means uh, the first selection board a sailor encounters a lot, a lot of the times is an officer programs selection board. And a lot of the times, I mean, it's it's there's a, a lot of sailors out there who the first selection board they encounter and the one that they want to get selected by is an officer program. So it's very, very important for leadership at the enlisted level to understand that and to take those evals very seriously. Uh, it's something that it's the only it's one of the primary documents that a state 21 selection board is going to have to evaluate a sailor. So I'm off my soapbox now, but take the time to take that seriously because of stuff like that, because of that sentence right there. Right. It's it's performance will receive consideration, but. Uh, they want somebody with both the academic and leadership potential necessary to become an outstanding naval officer. And the re the way that they're going to figure that out is the documentation submitted to the board. Very important part of that is an illicit evaluation for an E2 or an E3 or an E4. So take them seriously. All right. Stay 21 has two components. NSI, an eight week course of intensive officer preparation and indoctrination at Officer Training School, Newport, Rhode Island, attended by all selectees in route to their university assignment. Full-time year-round study for up to 36 months at an NROTC-affiliated university, 
All selectees will be ordered to an NROTC unit on a PCS basis and may choose to enroll in either the NROTC host institution or one of its affiliated crosstown universities as listed in Appendix B. State 21 officer candidates will participate in drills with their NROTC unit, attend two Naval Science Leadership courses, and are strongly recommended to hold leadership positions within the unit. State 21 officer candidates do not participate in the NROTC midshipman cruises. They remain on campus to attend classes during summer academic sessions. So much like some of the other officer programs that we talked about, you got to attend college year round for 36 months or less to get your degree. State 21 students receive full pay and allowances uh, for their enlisted pay grades and are eligible for advancement while participating in the program. Service members enrolled and active in the State 21 program will be waived from the leadership development course requirements to participate in the enlisted advancement exams uh, for advancement. If disenrolled from State 21 program, the service member will take the proper leadership development courses, et cetera, when they get to the fleet. All other requirements for advancement uh, should be completed prior to detaching from the present command. Entitlement to an SRB is specified in reference L. Uh, so if you re-enlist, there, it could get a little weird with the uh, enlist because you're getting an SRB to re-enlist in your enlisted rating and you're not going to be in your enlisted rating. So you may get docked some money there. Uh, or especially if you like re-enlisted two years ago for five years and you're not going to complete the whole thing, they may stop your installments, stuff like that. So just do that research and understand how that's going to affect you financially. Once the service member transfers from the command with orders to NSI, the member is no longer eligible to receive SRB bonus installments, like I just mentioned. So the further installments won't come. Maybe they try to recoup some. I, just do the research. It's going to get weird. All uh, special duty assignment pay will cease because you're not in that assignment anymore. Some special pays may continue for those individuals selected for and participating in State 21 for special warfare or EOD options. Uh, if because they're going to go back to special warfare or EOD, presumably. So there's they may get to keep some special pays for specific program qualifications uh, that are maintained as directed by NAF PERSCOM. Maintenance of certain special warfare and EOD skills enhances safety and is more cost effective than periodic retraining as required when such skills lapse. So assuming these uh, sailors are going back as officers to the special warfare or EOD community, they're just going to continue paying them the incentive paid to maintain that skill because it makes more sense. Students uh, receive up to $10,000 per year paid to the university by Naval Service Training Command to supplement the cost of tuition books and fees, uh, i.e. if tuition books, fees, and uh, blah, 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 can total $7,000. Only $7,000 will be paid uh, by the State 21 program. If tuition, fees, books, blah, 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 total $13,000, the selectee must pay $3,000. Uh, the $10,000 is dispersed in increments by school term Therefore, students receive $4,000 for the fall, excuse me, and spring term, and $2,000 for the summer term. Students attending quarter schools will receive $2,500 per quarter. State 21 students are neither eligible for tuition assistance or the GI Bill benefits uh, to, or the Veterans Education Assistance Program benefits. Uh, to pay for the schooling. So just understand that going in that there's a certain amount of money you're going to get every year. And if you exceed that, you're going to have to pay the difference. Uh, eligibility, be a citizen of the United States, no waivers, be recommended by your CEO and have a good moral character, officer potential and unquestionable loyalty to the United States. Conspicuous by its absence is stuff about NJPs. Uh, I don't know if that stuff figures in and I'm not sure why they didn't list it. So that's something that you may need to contact the program office for this specific thing. I'm um, scrolling down really quick. In my, oh, here we go. So have no record of course. I was going to say, this is weird that it's in two different spots. Have no record of core martial convictions, blah, 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 uh, or DWI, DUI for three years preceding application date. So it's, pr it's pretty much the same thing. So the same, uh, same requirements. I was going to say that's very strange. Looks like I should have read ahead a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I wrote this outline like a month and a half ago in my defense. So, uh, yeah. Be serving in the U.S. Navy on active duty, FTS, cell res, Navy reservists on active duty, uh, except for those in the categories we mentioned previously. Uh, individual option programs may have additional requirements and specific restrictions abate, like on what your status of service is. So just refer to Section 2 for community-specific information on State 21. Be a high school graduate, high school diploma or equivalency certificates based on military education experience and GED test results are acceptable to meet the educational requirements if issued by the Department of Education of a state, Commonwealth, Territory, the United States or District of Columbia. 
be able to complete requirements for a baccalaureate degree within 36 months, much like all the other programs. Applicants are encouraged to occur as many f fine, uh, fully transferable semester hours of earned credit as possible before beginning state 21. So, it, you know, as you're as you're meeting the requirements in the fleet to apply for an officer program and you're, you know, a lot of times like on submarines, you have to get your submarine dolphins or the CO won't endorse it. So that's a year on your first submarine. They also won't let you do NC pace or clap or anything else. So you can't really incur the college credits, but some in-service schools might transfer once you're done with your dolphins and you apply, you might not get selected the first time. So just take some pace courses, clap some courses, do whatever you can to get as many transferable credits as you can prior to uh, beginning a state 21 program, which implies, of course, that you have to get selected. So you, you may have to apply multiple times before you're selected. So just make sure you're doing this stuff, because the more you get done, the faster you'll get commissioned, uh, less time you got to spend in school, et cetera. Credits obtained through regionally accredited colleges or universities or the Navy College Program for a float college education or NC PACE program are considered fully transferable. Many universities do not accept all transferable credits because of their individual policies governing transfer credits, non-traditional credits, i.e. military service and service school credits, club courses, vocational technical school credits, correspondence courses, or other NC PACE, etc., should be used to obtain advanced academic standing to the maximum extent permitted by the university in which enrolled. Normally, credits obtained from foreign institutions are accepted. However, again, not all are considered fully transferable. Navy College Office counselors should be contacted for educational counseling to include determination of which credits will transfer to specific universities. That's important. A lot of time, the Navy College Office will help you find the university with your program that will take the maximum amount of credits. They have the ability to kind of help you search for a school that will maximize the credit that you do have from the places that you have it. So make sure you talk to the Navy College Office and leverage that resource. Be able to complete degree requirements and be commissioned by age requirements as specified by specific option programs, which are addressed in section two. So make sure you read that. Again, there's a lot of specific programs that fall with under the state 21 umbrella. So you need to make sure you're meeting all the specific requirements for what you're applying for. Maintain a cumulative GPA of 2.5 or better on a 4.0 scale while enrolled in state 21. Must obtain a minimum of a 2.0 on the required calculus and physics courses. Uh, certain state 21 option programs may have different requirements because, of course, they do. And are addressed in section two. So, again, when you're researching your specific program that you're applying for, the option program, make sure you're meeting all those requirements. There's going to be requirements you have to maintain while you're actually in school. So make sure you're very well aware of those, like highlight them and laminate them to your desk. Have a certified copy of SAT or ACT scores no older than three years from application due date. The new SAT contains three sections. Only the math and critical reading verbal sections will be considered. A minimum score of 1,000 SAT with minimum score is 500 math and 500 critical reading verbal or a 41 ACT combined math and English with minimum scores of 21 math and 20 English is required. No waivers will be considered. Certain state 21 option programs may have more stringent requirements because of course they do. So <laughs> make sure... You, these are general requirements that I'm reading. Make sure you're consulting the option program for which you're applying. Meet physical commissioning standards for appointment in the unrestricted line, engineering corps, nurse corps, etc. cetera, uh, program for which you're applying, essentially, prescribed in reference N and the physical fitness standard as prescribed in reference A. So there's going to be certain physical standards in for your, your designator and the physical fitness standards required of the entire Navy. Make sure you meet both of them. Have no record of court martial and et cetera, which we read earlier. So just make sure that, uh, like all of them, within three years of the application due date is the is the key word, key, tricky phrase that you need to pay attention to. So within three years, so a sailor can apply if they've had an NJP. They just need to meet all of those requirements and three years preceding the application date. So as long as they're outside that three year window, they're good. Have passed a PFA test taken within the year of the application, obtaining a good high or better. No waivers. So good high or better on your last PRT. Individuals who have already obtained their baccalaureate degree are not eligible for State 21 and should apply directly for OCS for obvious reasons. We just went over all that stuff. So go back to Chapter 4 and check out OCS. Maintain eligibility requirements of Paragraph 5 during the application period and during participation in the program. So again, just you have to maintain the eligibility requirements throughout uh, your the application period and then when you're actually going to school so the application process holy crap we're finally done with explain it only took me like an hour to go through all of the specific program stuff and that was not all of it if you can believe that it took me an hour to read to you 
general descriptions and general eligibility requirements for all those programs. And I considered, I act, I can't, I actually considered diving a little deeper, but it's just, you, I'm already giving you a lot in this podcast and I don't know how long you've even stuck with me if you're here at this point. So just understand that there is more to it. Checklists, program specifics, et cetera. I'm going to go through it in the general covering of the application process as well, but you have to do the research. You have to get out a highlighter, a pen and a notebook, go through it and digest it all in graphic detail for the application process generally for your specific program and then the checklist and then find a mentor to help you understand all and digest all that. All right. You have to. It's not all going to make sense immediately. All right. I was I looked up a bunch of stuff to just to do this episode and I still don't graphically and in the detail required to apply and succeed understand all these programs so just get a mentor and go through and and do all of the research on your program specifically okay application process so chapter two of the opnav instruction 1420.1 series is the application process they have a whole chapter on it so this chapter is very procedural and walks you block by block through exactly what needs to be put in each block of the application generally okay it's it's like an administrative explanation because As you work through the application, you need to refer to your program specific chapter and especially that checklist because it distills down the chapter to make sure you don't screw up the application because they're like it's going to explain that generally in chapter two how to fill it out. But then there's going to be your program specific stuff and checklists that are going to help you not fail at, at, at doing the other stuff that has to get done that's specific to your program. So program specific stuff and checklists. Every single program has specific things required to be done on each application and they're different. So make sure while you're completing the application, which is the same as every other program, you're you're all using the same application form, but you got to do different stuff. So you also need to be reviewing the application process section of your program specific chapter to ensure that any deviations or extra steps are added to what is detailed in chapter two and use your checklists. So the Naval Academy, OCS, ODS, MESAPS, MSCIPP, LDO, CWO, and State 21 all have program-specific checklists in the back of the instruction. These checklists are invaluable to ensure you capture every requirement for your program application, so use them. Like, you should have that thing laminated and go through it multiple times to make sure everything's done, have somebody else go through your package once you think it's complete and audit it and make sure that everything's done. Your mentor should be constantly going through it, tweaking getting it all ready so that we're positive when you submit that thing that everything's done and it's done correctly. So with chapter two and the program specific stuff and the checklists, there's an, there's nav admins and there's board pages for, for most of the stuff. So I have a lot of links in the description, which I highly recommend you check out. But just understand that there is also amplifying information a lot of the time. So the 1420.1 current revision that we're on is Bravo, but it, it could and should get updated soon. There, The nav admin that comes out for soliciting applications to all these programs every year, which they all have nav admins, there can be amplifying information. And this this is true for every, every instruction in the Navy. There could be a nav admin updating or amplifying or adding on top of what's in the instructions. So you need to be paying attention to that as well. So always consult the nav admin soliciting applications for your program. See, they generally come out annually and we'll have the most up-to-date policy guidance uh, for applicants that sometimes is contrary or in addition to, like I mentioned, to what you find in the instruction. Also, consult the available board pages. So uh, the links that I have in the show notes are for like the LDO CWO board page on MPC. MSC IPP has a specific website under like the NavMed umbrella um, that has some good resources and information there. Just there's if, if there's a resource out there, you should leverage it. Make sure it's official. Make sure it's accurate. Make sure you start with the instruction and then you go to the nav admin, et cetera. But it can seem overwhelming and it it kind of is in a, in, in, a, in a way, but it's very, very doable. It's very navigable, navigatable, something like that. <laughs> you can get through this. Just understand you start with the instruction. You work from the instruction. You get the nav admin and the checklist and everything else. You start completing the application, but get a mentor. And this is a big one that I want to cover. It's like I cannot overstress how important it is for you to get a mentor and don't just get a mentor that 
was commissioned from the enlisted ranks random program, right? You find whatever you want to apply for, whether it's state 21, whether it's LDOCWO, MSCIPP, find someone who commissioned through that program particularly, but even better, like that's, that's a good start. Even better if you can find a mentor that commissioned through that program into the exact designator or option or whatever that you're applying for. That's what you're looking for. All right. Because not only did they navigate the process, like if, if all you can find, if you're trying to apply for MSC IPP and all you can find is somebody that applied for MSC IPP uh, for a pharmacist and you're trying to do healthcare administration, it's better than not having a mentor at all. OK, <laughs> like they can definitely help you out and they probably can help you find a pharmacist. Or I guess if you're doing healthcare administration, they can probably also find you out, somebody in healthcare administration. But it's a great start to find a mentor that is specific to your commissioning program. But what you really want is somebody that is specific to your commissioning program and your designator. OK, and like there is a way to do it. Like if you want <laughs> Like shoot up those flares. I talked about this earlier in the episode, but take the time to go to like basic mentoring Facebook group or other Facebook groups that are specific to officer commissioning or Reddit or shoot a flare to me and I'll help you find somebody or talk to your officers in your wardroom and see if they know anybody. If it's medical stuff, go to the clinic and say, hey, is there any nurse corps officers here? Go to the place where these officers would work and start asking for help. Um, squeaky wheel. I'm telling you right now. You will do nothing but impress the people that you need help from by cold calling, by shooting out an email, by walking into their building and just saying, hi, I really want to be this when I grow up. Is there anybody here that can help me? It takes It takes courage to do that. And the fact that you're willing to just show up um, and ask for help from your chiefs too, like that can help or your supervisors. It could be a first class, it could be a second, whatever. But it's a lot easier for me to walk into a building or cold call someone than it is for you, especially if I'm cold calling a chief. So that can help as that can help kind of kind of get the first step in the right direction of getting you the mentor and getting you the connections that you need. But um, it, there's so many ways to do it that there's no excuse not to have a mentor. So get a mentor because it's incredibly important to helping you navigate this process and not get overwhelmed and not do the wrong thing or miss something. Check out the MPC page for commissioning programs. Okay, there's one generally for commissioning programs, tons of resources for all the programs, useful links to websites and downloadable fillable forms. That's very helpful. Lots of great resources. The link is in the show notes and the outlines. Lots of links for this episode and they're all in the show notes and the outline. Um, also make sure if there are board precepts or a convening letter available to you, uh, for example, LDOCWO, uh, you need to review them in detail. It's a roadmap for what they want in their selection process, okay? All right, so to wrap this up, if you've stayed with me this long, and I'm gonna put timestamps in, uh, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, maybe I'll edit it, edit it in, but I'm gonna put timestamps so that if somebody wants to jump to an episode, like or to a program specific part of the episode, you can, but why should someone not applying for officer programs care about anything I just spent over 90 minutes talking about? So, like, first and obvious to me is that if you're a leader, right, if you're in a leadership position, if you're leading sailors in any way, shape or form, you're going to be the first point of contact for a junior sailor that desires to get commissioned. Whether it's via a career development board or just them approaching and asking how, like, hey, this is the thing I want to do. How do I do it? The more you know, the more you can help, right? Obviously, it's not expected that you're the subject matter expert for officer programs. That's why you have a command career counselor, and that's why I push so hard, and so does everyone else, for you to get an officer mentor in the designator or option or whatever for your commissioning program. But that doesn't mean your awareness that there are programs for commissioning sailors in medical administration as an, and as physician assistants and whatever else. It doesn't mean that that can't be invaluable for retaining a sailor and helping shape their futures. Right. That doesn't mean that you don't need to know anything. And that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. I talk a lot about my time as a command career counselor because so many sailors, when asked what they wanted to do, answered, well, I wanted to be a super Navy SEAL Rambo ninja, but was told it's impossible. And now I'm stuck on submarines. And 
Some of that might just be a 19 year old kid with a big ego that wants to tell people that that's what they want to do and didn't actually have the courage to pursue that program. And I'm just being honest. But a lot of times it seems like through some kind of a misadventure, a sailor ends up in a different place because maybe they got pressured into it. Maybe they were scared in boot camp and had to reclassify. Maybe they were whatever. I, I don't know. Um, you could very easily use me as an example for that. I came in the Navy as a corpsman and they screwed up a drug waiver that I had coming in and told me I had to reclassify because they screwed up my paperwork and I was getting screamed at it in boot camp told being told I was a liar and an idiot for telling the truth and then getting up at the moment of truth and saying, Hey, you guys screwed up my paperwork. Cause it said alcohol abuse and I'd never touched alcohol in my life up to that point. So I was like, I'm thinking to myself, like long-term career wise, I'm like, I don't want my record to say I have alcohol abuse in there because I might make this a career. So I want to get this fixed. And they, it got turned around on me saying I lied the first time, which I didn't. Uh, they just screwed up my paperwork. Um, and so I had to reclassify in boot camp, and that's how I ended up a CS. Uh, I'm not mad that it happened that way. I'm a, everything happens for a reason guy, and I have enjoyed my career immensely up to this point. But there's a lot of sailors that find themselves in a position that they supposedly didn't want to be in for whatever reason. Maybe they really didn't. Maybe it was. it's just what they're saying. Who knows? But I've cross-rated two submarine CS2s to cryptologic technician, both of which intended to separate but are now chief petty officers within their new rating, right? I couldn't have done that without program awareness. If I didn't know that there was a program that you could make it uh, like a contingent upon reenlistment, I will like if I'm going to give the Navy my contract, I'm going to reenlist. And as as an incentive for me doing that, they're going to cross rate me to CT. It's and when I said it, I had a CMC tell me that that wasn't real anymore. I'm like, well, the Milpers man says it is. So I applied for both of them. Uh, like we fit, I didn't, I, I helped them apply. We went through the application process for both of those sailors and they both got it picked up for conversion. And now they're both chiefs valuably contributing to our nation's defense. And they wouldn't have been because they would have separated because they didn't want to be cooks anymore, which is fine. But had I not had the program awareness and been in the Millipers manual and been studying so that I was a good career counselor, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, obviously, I was supposed to know these things because I was supposed to be the subject matter expert as a command career counselor. But there's nothing stopping you from reviewing the career counselor handbook and the officer programs instruction that I just went on and on and on about or the Millpers man articles associated with the types of programs I just talked about. It's extremely important to retention and training your relief to answer with actual information and a path towards their goals instead of just shrugging them off or passing on tribal knowledge based denials, which happens far too often and leads to us losing the best and brightest. Those sailors I cross rated to CT had been told that they could not cross rate because they were on submarines that you're just no, you're stuck on submarines for life, bro. And it's not true. It's not true. It's just some tribal knowledge BS that's passed down from like, you know, generation to generation. If you take the time to at least get program awareness, I'm not saying you need command career counselor level uh, in-depth detailed knowledge that I had when I was a command career counselor because I don't have it now. I'm not as up on those. Pro I, I would say I'm probably in the middle. I'm not as up on those programs as I was when I was a command career counselor because I was a command career counselor like, God, it was 20... 13 or something the last time I had that cookie on. So like, I don't, I'm way, way far removed, but I go out of my way to stay informed. And I do things like this. Like I, I spend time researching this for the podcast. So it gets me back up to date, but, I, and I'm not saying you have to go as, as ridiculous as I do because I'm doing it for the podcast, but Program awareness is really important. Take time to read the nav admins that come out. Take time to, uh, when you see something kind of curious, like an MSC IPP nav admin soliciting applications, like what is that? Do a little research. Maybe take a look at the website. Take a look at the officer programs instruction. And now you know. And that's just like a little thing that you had like quarters or something you can put out. Hey, this nav admin came out soliciting applications. If anybody's interested in healthcare administration, 
blah 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 you put that and that might that might be all it takes to plant a seed in the sailor's head to start pursuing a degree in whatever field they want or apply for the program or whatever it's a big deal and if a sailor comes to you and says they want to be an officer you should have general program awareness on this so if you didn't listen to the whole episode and now you're just listening to me telling me or telling you that you should listen to the whole episode, go listen to the whole episode. It's faster than reading the whole instruction. I can tell you that right now because I just did. Um, So yeah, yeah. In summary, we talked about officer programs and where to find the official guidance, specific details of each program and basic eligibility requirements, and then why leaders should care about topics like this, right? Junior sailors, this one's for you. You need to be vocal early and often when pursuing a commission. Don't take no for an answer. And you might get that type of an answer like my sailors that are CTs now. You might get the, well, you can't do that because. Don't accept that. It's not true. This There might be some prerequisite stuff. You might have to get your warfare pin first. You might have to do a year on board. You might, there might be some things that your commanding officer is like, yeah, hey, I'm not endorsing a package until. Okay, so now you got now you got a finish line. Now you got a goalpost. So pursue that. Do all the things you can do to prepare in route to that. Perform at a high level so your evaluations reflect that you have the leadership potential and you perform at a high level in your current program. And then when you get to that goalpost, you're ready to apply. And you can take the time to seek out a mentor early. And you can take a time, take your time to do all the research and start preparing your application so that the day that you're eligible, you can start applying. But you need to be the squeaky wheel when pursuing these things. This starts with getting in the book, leveraging all the available resources, and seeking a mentor in the community for which you're applying. If you show people that you really want something instead of just saying it out loud, the universe will conspire to help you. All right. Don't let anyone tell you no. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't. I tell sailors all the time when they ask if they can do something, right? Well, I don't know. Like, let's let's find out. Let's do the research. And then I will absolutely, whoever's run, whoever is running that program up in the up in the nav pers or bumet or whatever stratosphere i will make them tell me no i'm not just going to read an instruction and tell you ah, i don't i don't think you're eligible or maybe you can't do that because blah 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 or passed on tribal knowledge saying that you can't i'm going to make that program tell me no because i had my cmc told me these kids weren't eligible for the selective conversion whatever to rewrite i forget it's a score program i forget what the acronym uh, stands for but I was told that the program wasn't real and they weren't eligible. Turns out they were because they're all C- they're both CTs chiefs right now. So I'm going to make somebody tell me no. I'm going to make the program owner tell me no. Maybe my CO told me no at that level, but I'm going to route the paperwork and you're going to tell me no. That's the worst thing that can happen. But if you never ask or apply or inquire, then you're never going to know. And so many times when I could get a sailor to try, the answer was yes. I talk about my search and rescue swim, swimmer all the time. She's a CS1 who's transitioning out of the Navy now, which, I, you know, breaks my heart a little bit, but that's fine. That's what she wanted to do, right? But she asked in A school when I was her A school instructor, she's one of my class leaders, she said she wanted to be a search and rescue swimmer when she got to the ship. I said, and she asked me that question. And when I say that out loud and I, and I relay this story, a lot of the times I can see I starting to roll before I finish it. And that's what she was up against when she went to the ship and asked this question. But she had the benefit of encountering me and I'm not trying to pump my own ego up here or anything who said to her, hell yes, you can do that. And don't let anybody tell you different because they will. I got ahead of the problem and I got to tell her that for her, they would doubt her for being small, for being a woman, for being a cook. Show them that they're wrong. Be the squeaky wheel. Don't just say you want to be a SAR swimmer. Show them. Show up to their PT. Work out a ton. Prepare. Do all the things you need to do. Route chits to go to the school. Whatever you need to do. Go pester the SAR swimmers all the time while they're underway doing things. Put yourself in a position to be undeniable. She ended up a first class petty officer inside four and a half years that was not only a SAR swimmer on the ship she was assigned to, but is leaving the Navy after a successful tour in Pensacola as a search and rescue swimmer school instructor. 
She's been an instructor teaching every other sailor that goes through that school how to be a SAR swimmer. So she didn't just do it. She crushed it. She didn't just get to go to the ship and be a collateral duty SAR swimmer. She went and it was her primary duty for three years to instruct sailors on how to be an excellent SAR swimmer. How about that? Be equipped to show your sailors the path, lead them down it, and at times give them a push. That's how we get better. It's how we retain the best and brightest and get them into places they need to be. It's how we lead. If you need anything from us, hit us up. Don't give up the ship podcast at gmail.com. You can Facebook message us. Don't give up the ship podcast. Or you can DM me on Instagram or Reddit. D gets podcast. You can get on the D gets podcast sub on Reddit as well and discuss things about the episodes, ask questions, comments, whatever. Hit us up. If you got questions specifically about officer programs, uh, again, I know some things and I know some people that I can ask questions when I don't know the things. Okay. If you have questions or you need help or you need to be pointed in the right direction, let me know, hit us up, email us, DM us, whatever's, whatever works best for you. And I will do everything I can to help you out. Um, but leverage all those resources. There are a ton of resources and then get yourself a mentor because that's I like I can help point you in the right direction and I can help you find a mentor. But that mentor is indispensable to this process and you absolutely need it to succeed. So take the time to do that. Even if you're not currently el- eligible, you will be eventually. So take the time to find a mentor and they will help you work through it. In the, in the, in the age of Facebook and Instagram and Zoom and FaceTime and Skype and all this crap, it's like they don't have to be local. So get on the internet if you don't have a local resource or if you strike out walking into a shop or asking somebody in your wardroom or whatever, get on the internet and we'll, we will find somebody. Like, Worst case scenario, I will find you someone that's not local so you can Zoom and FaceTime and whatever and email back and forth uh, so they can help you out. But they can do everything they need to do for you remotely. Uh, So find yourself a mentor. Uh, If you would, be so kind, like, share, subscribe, review, do all the things on all the platforms. Uh, It helps us get the the word out that resources like this exist so that some lucky soul can hear me drone on for two hours about officer programs. (laughs) So please... Please leverage all those algorithms to help get the word out uh, that we exist and that uh, this resource exists to help sailors uh, get their commissions and be better naval leaders, etc. Um, if you want to support us, you can go to dgetspodcast.com slash shop. We got so got shirts and magnets and pins and such and stickers. Um, it just helps keep the lights on. We got a bunch of subscription fees and all kinds of other costs to uh, keep doing this project. So if you want to support us and get some cool stuff as a result you can do that i haven't been plugging that for a while and i'm not sure why i think i just forgot because i knew with the medical treatment stuff i was going to be down for a while and probably not be able to ship stuff but um but yeah if you want to support us that's the way to do it uh and that's it that's what i got for you today thank you so much for listening and don't give up the ship